This third lecture is on math and music, so it's a very different lecture than what we had in the first two times, um, in that it's, I guess it's something of a special passion of mine, and I just wanted to explain that very briefly. Uh, this really came out of interest that I had, uh, that I had developed while I was trying to come up with uh, a curriculum in 10th grade, and I developed a unit, and this was partly through collaboration with uh, a teacher in Wilton, New Hampshire at the High Mowing School named Cedar Oliver. And he gave me some ideas for this particular unit that I've now developed in my 10th grade workbook that I do with my students. And I actually found that, as it was, quite interesting. And then I ended up having some conversations with my daughter Shanti, Shanti's over here, and with her violin teacher, uh, Lena Bond, who's at the University of Colorado, uh, professor of violin. And I started having some conversations with Lena, and I found it quite interesting as we engaged more, and we actually met a few times and shared ideas, and I found it quite fascinating that I am not a musician. Uh, I guess I had a little bit of musical, very little bit of musical background. When I was in high school, uh, I played trombone in the marching band, so I was able to read music, but I certainly wouldn't have called myself a musician. And yet, through my studies and interests, I had, um, I wouldn't say discovered, but perhaps, yes, partly discovered some ideas of my own. And I was sharing the, these ideas with this violin professor, Lena Bond, and, and she, I had actually said some things that I thought some, any musician would know, and surprised to find out that she didn't necessarily know, and then talking with other people, other people didn't know it either, and then there were some basic things that they were surprised that I didn't know, and so it was really quite an interesting collaboration. She then invited me uh, to CU to give a lecture at the, to the CU College of Music, which I did about a year ago now. Um, so it was different. It was many students, uh, graduate students, undergraduate students, a few professors, etc. Um, and I did this at CU, as I said, a year ago. Uh, I think there were about 100 people there at the time. I did a very, uh, my first ever PowerPoint presentation. It was much more lecture oriented. And tonight, uh, for various reasons, I've decided, partly because of the filming aspect, I've decided that uh, the PowerPoint wouldn't work as well. So I put a lot of things up on the board, and we're going to try to fill some of these things out um, as we go here. And I'm also making it more experiential. And so actually quite soon off here, we're going to break into smaller groups, if you will. And uh, is there anybody that has experience playing a string instrument that could even help with another? Perhaps you could be in my group then, because I'm going to have a cello, Kathleen Starr, our esteemed cello teacher and orchestra conductor at our school here, is going to help us. Um, also, she'll be kind of with another group, and, and Shanti will lead another group to try to discover some of these things that I'll be presenting. So I think that'll make it a little bit more experiential, hopefully a little bit more fun. Um, so there's a little bit of background of what, how I got to here. Um, so what I'd like to do is give a little bit of a background now in terms of Waldorf education and where this really fits in. Um, acoustics, for those who, who may know this, uh, physics actually begins in the Waldorf school proper in sixth grade. And so it is in sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade that we do little bits of various topics of physics. And so we do optics, we'll do electricity and magnetism, and we'll do them each of the three years. And then they take another, uh, they, they become, I'd say, certainly much more uh, sophisticated. We go into more depth in high school in these various topics. But in seventh grade, acoustics is when we first start to investigate these Pythagorean, Pythagorean ratios of music. And so that's what we're going to be doing in just a, a minute. And this fits in nicely into the math curriculum, not only with the acoustics and the math, because it really has to do with ratios. And ratios are a key theme in seventh grade mathematics as well. So um, what I would like to do is, is to say that my 10th grade unit here, and that's largely, I'm going to be taking predominantly what I do in 10th grade and boiling it down to about an hour and 20 minutes or so. Maybe it'll go an hour and a half. So it's going to be kind of fast. Uh, I'm going to try to make it so that it works. Please ask questions. Correct me if somehow I make a little bit of a mistake. I hope this will work for everyone. Um, you guys aren't in 10th grade, um, and yet 
Um, as adults, you'll be able to kind of go along with the gist of what I'm doing. I'm going to keep the math pretty simple, although at, at one partic particular point it does get somewhat sophisticated, and I'm going to try to make sure that that actually works for all of you. Uh, but the driving question of this 10th grade unit on math and music really starts, the beginning starts with how can you really calculate the frequencies of the notes on a piano? That was, that was the thing that I was originally trying to figure out, and that is largely the climax of what I do in my 10th grade unit and what I'm going to do with you all here. That was a question for me. You know, we've all, we've all heard, that we've all seen perhaps piano tuners, they come in and they have to tune the piano to certain frequencies. I'm even going to talk a little bit about in a moment here what is really meant by the idea of frequency and, and how all, all of that can be measured. Um, so we're also going to learn about various uh, types of musical scales uh, from a math perspective especially. And in the end, I hope that I'll get to the point, I think we'll be able to do this, is to investigate the whole idea of harmonics. Uh, so those who know a little bit about, and you don't even have to be much of a musician, uh, you, you, we've all seen guitarists or a violinist or a cellist that, that somehow plays a note in a different way and just touches the string and it gives a different quality. So we're going to investigate that a little bit as well. Um, so let's start with some terminology here. And I first want to acknowledge that for me as a math person, when I came a, a, across some of these terms, I was very confused. So I'd like to clarify some of this uh, some of these terms that actually can be quite confusing. Um, I think most everybody has heard of the idea of a fifth. And if you haven't, I'll just explain, uh, I guess, briefly what it is. Shanti's going to play, if you could do that, just play two notes that are a fifth apart now. Um, and that's this whole idea that we have notes that together sound nicely. Come on up, Shanti. Two notes separately and then together. So it's a very familiar interval, I think, for all of us. And, and somewhere deep inside us, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more, um, it, it, it somehow resonates with us in a special way. And Pythagoras very much talked about that, as I will in a moment. Um, so the fifth. Why is the fifth as a term confusing? Well, at first, when I picture a fifth, of course, I picture a fraction, one-fifth. Well, that's not at all what we're talking about. That's not it. So that's the first thing you get rid of. It doesn't have anything to do with that. And it has to do with something we're told to do with the fifth step. But it's not even that either. You know, that's, so it's, it's very odd. In other words, if I go, if I decide that I'm going from the number 23 up to 27, and I ask how many steps are involved with that, it's really a subtraction problem, isn't it? Then I start at 23, and then I take a step to 24. That's my first step. And then I go to 25, 26, 27. So I said there are four steps. Unfortunately, with the fifth, it's not even five steps. It's actually four steps. And so it, it would be kind of like counting the steps from here to here. And you start by counting 23, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. So that's how they count in music. It's a bit odd. And it ends up being a little bit confusing when we try to do things mathematically. But I'm just naming that right off the bat. So when we talk about the second, the interval of the second going from a C to a D, that's really one step, all right, one step. So we go from C to D, that's one step. We call that the major second, that M stands for major. And then we have major third, which is going from a C to a D to an E. The one reason why I'm starting, this is a C major scale, of what I'm using right up here. And the reason why a C major scale is nice and convenient is it doesn't have any sharps and flats. So you don't have to be a musician, you just, just recognize that. So if I talk about the fifth, and if I start from C, and I go up a fifth, then I'm going to start counting with C, D, E, F, G. So C to G is the fifth. And why is the fifth important? Just because it's something that really resonates with us. We hear it, it sounds nice. That's why it's so important, pure and simple. I'll just say this. Um, what we want to identify, and this is certainly what Pythagoras was interested in, is what are the intervals that are the most fundamental, the ones that sound the best to us. You can picture this Pythagoras walking through his village, and he was walking by a blacksmith shop, and he noticed that the blacksmith, in doing his work, was hitting you know, this iron bar or something with different sized hammers. And so he noticed that depending on the size of the hammer, it actually gave a different tone. So we started to investigate this. You can imagine where, you know, somewhat scientifically, 
where this goes. And eventually, he starts to then investigate how the length of a string determines or has an effect on pitch. And of course, that's what a violin is doing. Shanti can come back up here again. Um, so what we notice is we're going to start out with a certain string length. And as we make the length of the strings shorter, then what we're going to see is that the pitch changes. So if we do an open string, and she doesn't have her finger on the string at all. Um, and so the whole length of the string is here. But then as she moves her finger down, the pitch is going to go higher and higher. So she's shortening the string as she goes there. Um, so what I want to do now, stay up here for just one moment. I'm just going to show one thing here. He started to investigate this idea of how the intervals are, again, related to the string length. And now what we're going to do is we're going to see what happens if we take, which string were you using right there? Using the A string. So that's the second string in here. And Shanti's going to play an open A. And now she's going to make that string exactly half as long. So she's going to press her finger and bow and effect, shortening the string, making it half as long. So again, open. And then pressing down half as long. And so can you hear what that interval is here? That's actually what the octave is. Okay. And so what we're going to do right now in a moment is we are going to fill in this table here. So each group, if we can, um, if each group will be divided into, uh, we'll divide into three different groups here. And then we're going to fill out this table to figure out what these ratios are. So in order to do that, I have, in order to make this mathematical here, we have rulers. And so we're going to measure. And we can do that, actually, um, with Shanti's violin if we were to measure that length Bring it up here quickly. Sorry, I keep having you go back and forth. That's all right, though. I seem to, I seem to remember that it was 32. I'm just going to measure this here. And it is. It's 32.5 inches. And so if I were to actually do this, what I want you to do is you measure the, um, you measure the two notes. So in this case, one note was open. And the other note was where she was pressing. And if I were to measure that, I would see that it would be about 16.2 or 16.3. And then what I do is I take those two lengths. Are you following me? And if I had actually taken those two lengths of 32.5 and I divided that by 16.2 or 16.3, I'll see that that's very close to being equal to 2. And if I want to make that into a ratio, I'll say 2 to 1. So now what I've done is I've discovered in that way Although, of course, I cheated, didn't I? What I said is I said, put your finger at the halfway point and see what you get. And of course, we knew it would be an octave above.